Today's scripture comes from Mark 4, verses 21 through 25. He also said to them, Is a lamp brought in to be put under a basket or under a bed? Isn't it to be put on a lampstand? For there is nothing hidden that will not be revealed, and nothing concealed that will not be brought to light. If anyone has ears to hear, let him listen. And he said to them, Pay attention to what you hear. By the measure you use, it will be measured to you, and more will be added to you. For whoever has, more will be given to him, and whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away. This is the word of the Lord. Please be seated. Let's pray before getting into God's word. Lord, as we come to your word, we simply ask that you glorify your name in the preaching of your word by the power of your spirit in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. The sun is a light 24 hours a day, seven days a week, all day, every day. It never ceases to shine. Uh, But there is a problem. Even though the sun always shines, the earth gets gets dark every day. Why is this? It's because the earth is, is turning. It is spinning on its axis. So the area that's facing the sun as it is turning gets sunlight, as we are right now. But there are places on the planet right now that's getting darkness, simply because it is not, that area is not facing the sun. As I think about this and I think about God, there is absolutely no darkness in him at all. God is faithful. He's consistent. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. There is no shifting in him. But in order for us to be in his light, all we have to do is to turn toward him. We turn toward him in the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ, trusting him. And once we trust the Lord Jesus, we are now in the family of God and his light is always shining on us. But that does not mean that we will not have dark days. It does not mean that everything will be smooth in our lives. And this reminded me of a story in the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter three. In this in this book. Uh, We are told in Daniel chapter 3 of three men, three young boys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, right? These were Jews. Uh, When you read the book of Daniel, you also see this this guy, Daniel. Why were the Jews in this area? They were in an area called Babylon, but they were there because of their sin, the sin of the nation. God told them, if you continue to sin, if you continue to violate my covenant, I am going to expel you from this land. And God used the nation of Babylon to do it. So in Daniel chapter 3, Nebuchadnezzar, who was the king of Babylon, he decided to erect a statue. And he told the people, when you hear the sound, when you hear a sound, a particular sound, you ought to bow before this statue, worship before this statue. And this statue was a replica of Nebuchadnezzar himself. But Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they were like, nah, we're not doing that even though they knew it could cost them their lives. Like they were trusting God to deliver, but if God decided not to deliver them, they still would not bow and worship at this statue. When Nebuchadnezzar heard this, he got furious. So furious that he ordered these three young men to be bound, to be tied up and thrown into this fiery furnace. But before they were thrown in, he told the people, make the fire seven times hotter than normal. It was so hot that some of the men that would throw these young men in were killed by this fire. And so they were thrown into the fire bound. And Nebuchadnezzar, assuming that they are about to be incinerated, that they are about to be destroyed. But Nebuchadnezzar one day peeked in. And this is what it says in verses 24 and 25 of Daniel chapter 3. It says, then Nebuchadnezzar jumped up in alarm. He said to his advisors, didn't we throw three men bound into the fire? 
Yes, of course, your majesty, they replied to the king. He exclaimed, look, I see four men, not tied, walking around in the fire unharmed, and the fourth looks like a son of the gods. And this is beautiful because sometimes it lets us know that God will deliver you from trouble, like where you won't even have to go through a situation, but then sometimes he delivers us by being with us in it. He's with us in it. And this is what we see with Daniel, I mean, uh, the three Hebrew boys that they were in the fire, but Nebuchadnezzar saw them inside of the fire unbound and walking around. They were not destroyed by the fire. And Nebuchadnezzar said, I see one. I see someone else in there with him. He said, looks like the son of the gods, but we know this is God himself that came near to these young men while they were in distress. Today we are continuing in our sermon series in the Gospel of Mark, and in our section of scripture today, Jesus is continuing to teach the crowds using parables. Not only is the crowd before Jesus, but the disciples are before Jesus as well. They are with him. So the disciples are actually being trained as Jesus is, 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 is teaching the crowd using a parable, right? Mark 3.14 says that Jesus called the disciples to be with him. They were always with Jesus. Jesus was preparing them for the mission that he called them to. He's also modeling before the disciples what it looks like to engage people who really don't want to listen and pay attention to what Jesus has said. How do you engage the world with this message even when they don't respond rightly? See, when Jesus taught using parables, his most common subject was the kingdom of God. Our main point as we look at Mark chapter four, verses 21 through 25 is this. The secret of the kingdom of God is present in the person of Jesus. The secret of the kingdom of God is present in the person of Jesus. It is by Jesus that we understand the kingdom of God, for he is the true light. Jesus would say this of himself in John chapter 8, verse 12. I am the light of the world. Anyone who follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. As we uh, uh, look at Mark chapter 4, verse 21, Jesus uses the metaphor of a lamp, a lamp. In the Old Testament, a lamp is also a metaphor for God. It says this in 2 Samuel chapter 22, verse 29, Lord, you are my lamp. The Lord illuminates my darkness. I love it. Lord, you are my lamp. The Lord illuminates my darkness. The reason I love this is because daily when we look out at the world around us, not just around us, but we experience the hardships that we endure, right, that we go through. It, the days can seem dark. We don't even see light at the end of the tunnel. But scripture lets us know that God is our lamp. He illuminates our path that even though it's dark around me and there may be darkness within me, uh, because I may be going through some suffering that God is present with me and he is guiding me. It reminds me of Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall I have everything I need. I shall not want. Right. He guides me. He leads me even in this dark world. So as we walk through these verses, the two things I want us to notice are these. Number one, in verses 21 through 23, the light of God's word is to be received. The light of God's word is to be received. Jesus shows us that one day God's kingdom will be plain to all. But in order to be a part of this kingdom, we must pay attention to and receive Jesus. Then finally, in verses 24 through 25, I want us to see this, that we are accountable for what we do with what we've been given. We are accountable for what we do with what we've been, been given. We will either increase what we have by continuing to learn or grow, or we will lose what we have by refusing to learn and grow. There is no stagnation with this. 
So as we walk through these verses, I want to talk about truth made manifest. Truth made manifest. So let's look at this first point, that the light of God's word is to be received. Verses 21 through 23 again. Jesus says, uh, it, the word says, he also said to them, is a lamp brought in to be put under a basket or under a bed? Isn't it to be put on a lampstand? For there is nothing hidden that will not be revealed and nothing concealed that, that will not be brought to light. If anyone has ears to hear, let him listen. So these statements in these verses that we have consecutively in Mark are scattered throughout the gospel of Matthew. What does this mean? This means that it is clear that Jesus moved from audience to audience, repeating his teachings. And what's important also to note is that the disciples, as they continue to hear Jesus repeat these same teachings, they would have been able to memorize the teachings of Jesus being trained. Once again, it's also important for us to know that Jesus has given us these parables and he's talking about the kingdom of God. And in this parable, we have a parable about a lamp and a basket. Uh, last week, as we were talking uh, through verses uh, 1 through 20 of chapter 4, verses 10 through 20, Jesus is in a private setting. In verses 1 through 9, Jesus is on the shore talking, uh, talking to the crowds using a parable. But then he retreats to some private setting to explain the parable to his inner circle, these disciples. But in these verses, it seems that Jesus is now back on the shore by the Sea of Galilee because he is teaching in a parable. And so he spoke about a lamp. We all know what lamps are for. Lamps are designed to give light. It doesn't make sense to put a lamp under a basket or under a bed because you defeat the very purpose for which a lamp is created. In the context here, Mark is pointing to Jesus who is the lamp. He is the lamp. See, lamps give optimum light when elevated rather than being put under something. Just as Jesus and his teaching can't be placed in old wineskins, we learned about this in Mark, or conformed to an old garment, he cannot be placed under a bed or a basket. My friends, Jesus and his teachings are superior and supreme over all things. He is not subordinate to anything. He is the true light by which we see. The apostle John writes in John chapter 1 verses 6 through 10, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify about the light so that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but he came to testify about the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world he was in the world and the world was created through him and yet the world did not recognize him. God's purpose in Jesus is to enlighten and reveal. Enlighten and reveal. Jesus then says that there is nothing hidden that will not be revealed and nothing concealed that will not be brought to light. When he speaks of those things hidden, we must know that everything divine is primarily hidden. You and I do not have the capabilities of understanding without something happening to us that there is a divine world taking place around us right now. We don't have that ability for us to be able to understand uh, what is divine. Revelation must take place. It must take place. See, the beauty of scripture is that God has made himself known and you and I are able to know the father because Jesus has revealed him. Jesus would say in John chapter 17, verses 25 and 26, Righteous Father, the world has not known you. However, I have known you, and they have known that you sent me. I made your name known to them and will continue to make it known so that uh, the love you have loved me with may be in them and I may be in them. However, revelation is closed to people who are unwilling to receive it. It's closed to those who don't want to receive it. That's why Jesus says in verse 23, if anyone has ears to hear, let them listen. See, entrance into the kingdom comes by hearing. Romans chapter 10 says, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. But what are we hearing? 
See, it's not just any message that we hear. It is a specific message. It is the gospel message. And this is what Jesus came to proclaim so that if we trust in him, we then have a relationship with the father because of Jesus. My friends, relationship, uh, a religion void of relationship will leave you spiritually hungry. It's like drinking salt water. The more you drink salt water, the thirstier you become. We, all of us, are created to have a relationship through God, with God through Jesus Christ. And when we don't have a relationship through Jesus, we'll try to fill that void in our lives with, with, with other things. Uh, I know I'm not the only one that has done this. Um, where, God, I don't need you right now. I'm going to try to find life in drugs. I'm going to try to find life in partying. I'm going to try to find life in relationships. I'm going to try to find life in sports. Uh, notice it. Now, I, I know I'm about to mess with myself and others. Notice how much we worship at an athletic event. Now, I'm from Alabama. Y'all know where I'm going. Alabama, it's only two teams that you root for. I'm sorry for anyone who listens to this. You got Auburn and Alabama. And I know with COVID you can't go, but think about what happens on a Saturday, man. Stadiums are packed, right? To the brim minus COVID. Like people are there and we are following 17, 18, 19, 20, 21 year old young men. And our lives seem to rise and fall based on if our team wins. They lose, I'm crying. I am angry. Don't talk to me. I'm so mad uh, at another team that in Alabama, a guy goes and poisons a tree. Like, this is serious. My, my point is this. We turn to all of these other things to try to find life, to fill that space, to give us meaning when that space is only to be filled with the true light, and that is Jesus. He's the only one. But not only that, but as followers of Christ, we're called to be lights in the world as well. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, verses 14 through 16, he says, you are the light of the world. A city situated on a hill cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and puts it under a basket, but rather on a lampstand, and it gives light for all who are in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. Jesus came as the true light. Now you and I, because Jesus has gone back to the Father, we are waiting on his return. And as we are waiting on his return, Jesus says that now you and I are called to be lights in the world. Light does not originate from us. It comes from Jesus and we reflect his light for the world to see. As followers of Christ, we are now kingdom citizens which means we can't live the way we want to live anymore. We can't do what we want to do anymore. There is one we are accountable to. Because we have been rescued, our heart's disposition should be to honor the one who rescued us. Why? Because we are accountable to him. This leads us to our last point, that we are accountable for what we do with what we have been given. Finally, let's look at verses 24 through 25. And he said to them, pay attention to what you hear. By the measure you use, it will be measured to you and more will be added to you. For whoever has, more will be given to him. And whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. I want to ask a question. What voices are you paying attention to today? Who are you listening to? Are you paying attention to, to something other than God's word, believing that it will give you the answers that you seek? What voices, what podcasts, what radio shows, what television shows are you allowing to deposit into your life that you, you daily you wake up or you think that I need to hear what they're saying because they are going to give me what I need in this day? If it's not God through the Lord Jesus Christ that we have in his word, all of the other voices that we hear are impotent. 
But when Jesus speaks, he speaks for the purpose of transformation. That's why he said in verse 24, pay attention to what you hear. Uh, See, this Greek verb for uh, pay attention is the word blepo, and it means to process information by giving thought, direct one's attention to something, to consider, to to weigh, to carefully examine. Jesus is saying that you you need to carefully examine what you're hearing. You need to, to, to pay close attention to what you are hearing. He said this to the crowd, but not just to the crowd. He is saying to us that we must pay attention, pay attention to who we need to pay attention to what Jesus says. Now, my friends, we we, we, we have to fight the tendency to cherry pick scripture. Have any of y'all done that? You cherry pick what you want to read in the text. Right. We, we, we love to get to those parts of scripture where we see Jesus heal a woman with an issue of blood. Yes, that's powerful. We, we love when Jesus stops a funeral procession and tells uh, this dead young man to get up out of that casket, to get, to get up. And, and he gave this young man back to his mother. We love when Jesus right, takes a little girl by the hand and raises her up. We love when Jesus says, I am the light of the world. I am the bread of life. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. We love those things. But what about the other text that talks about suffering? What, what about those scriptures? That he says that, that we will have trouble in this world. Right. And I know for me that flies in my face because I am an American and I live in a culture of exceptionalism. I live in a culture of comfort. I don't want to suffer. But Jesus says in this life, we're going to have trouble. What about when he says deny that we must deny ourselves, take up our cross? What is the cross? The cross is a symbol of death. Take up our cross and follow him. What about when he says make disciples of all nations, not make disciples of people who look like you, not make disciples of your friends, but make disciples of all nations. What about those things? See, when we we when we pay attention to Jesus, we must pay attention to everything he has said. Jesus then states in this text, he says, by the measure you use, it will be measured back to you and more will be added to you. Now, this Greek word for measure means the rule or standard of judgment, the rule or standard of judgment. Jesus says that the measure or standard you use is the measure or standard you will get. He says it. Matthew records it this way in Matthew chapter seven, verse two. He says, for you will be judged by the same standard with which you judge others, and you will be measured by the same measure you use. Once again, as we connect this parable with what Jesus said in in, in verses 1 through 20 of chapter 4, hearing is vital to understanding Jesus and the kingdom of God. And this is not casual hearing or superficial hearing. This is active hearing, hearing that says, I want to hear more. I want to listen to more. Not just that, but I want to obey what Jesus has said. When a person receives the word with eagerness and joy, Jesus says more will be given. Each person, my friends, is accountable for what he or she does with what he or she had originally been given. See, the crowd could not claim that they didn't hear because they heard Jesus. But they were not listening for the purpose of obeying, for listening intently. But Jesus urged them to move from casual hearing and listening intently with the purpose of receiving more. However, the crowd uh, did not obey what they had received. And since they did not obey that, they would not receive more. Which brings me to this question. How many sermons have we heard in our lifetime? Hundreds of thousands, probably. I don't know. But we've heard a lot of sermons, right? My question is, did we obey what we heard? Like, think about it. We we heard a sermon last Sunday. The question becomes, did we obey what we heard last Sunday? Whoever we heard it from. The reason I ask this question, because I think sometimes we can treat the Sunday gathering like the crowds. 
especially in the South, because this is something we're supposed to do. I come in here, but I heard a good sermon. But has anyone ever asked you, like, what did the pastor preach about? You're like, uh, um, I can't remember. He said something about Jesus. My, my, my point is, uh, I'm, I'm just pointing to our heart because when we come and we hear, why are we listening? Why are we taking notes? Is, is it for the purpose of obeying? As a matter of fact, I was telling someone this week, every time a sermon is preached, I believe it's curriculum. It's curriculum. What do I mean? There are people who will listen to this sermon, whether they think it's good or not, but if they can hear truth in it, if Jesus is magnified, what would happen if all of the people who listen went and repeated the sermon? They don't have to preach it like me, but they went and shared it with someone else. Oh, that's a way that this whole area could be reached with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because that's what the disciples did. The disciples heard Jesus teach. Jesus unleashed them and they went and taught what he taught. So much so that you and I are sitting outside at Nightdale Station in our own chairs listening to the word of God. We have been rescued by him because of the faithfulness of the disciples. Will this continue on with us and the generations after us? For the one whose heart is hardened and refuses the word, this person will experience loss. Even what they have will be taken away. And Jesus says something similar in Matthew 25. In Matthew 25, he gave a parable about a master who was going on a long journey. And before he left, he entrusted to three guys. One guy he gave five talents to, one guy he gave two talents to, and one guy he gave one talent to. And he entrusted his resources. They were not, it, it, the, the, these three young men or whoever they were, they didn't have the resources. The master had the resources and the master wanted them to Put his resources to work. Now, when you read this parable and you see the word talent, don't think singing, don't think uh, uh, woodworking, carpentry, or any gifts I can do. This word for talent literally means money. One talent was worth 20 years worth of wages. So think of it this way. When the man would five, receive five talents, he received multi-millions of dollars. Two talents, he received multi-millions of dollars. And even the man with a talent received millions. The master said, put it to work. I'm going to return, but you don't know when I'm going to return. But when I return, I expect a return on my investment. So the one with five talents went and put those talents to work. He doubled it. The master says, man, well done, good and faithful servant. You know, he received more. The, the person with two did the same thing. He doubled it. The master rewarded him. Well done, good and faithful servant. But the dude with one, instead of him putting it to work, he complained about, yeah, the master hard. Like, I don't know. Like, I don't want to get in trouble. So I'm going to dig a hole and I'm going to put this one talent in it. The master returned. All of the guys had to give an account. And when it was his turn to give an account, this is what the word of God says in verses 26 through 29. The master said, you evil, lazy servant. If you knew that I reap where I haven't sown and gather where I haven't scattered, then you should have deposited my money with the bankers and I would have received my money back with interest when I returned. So take the talent from him and give it to the one who has 10 talents for to everyone who has more will be given and he will have more than enough. But from the one who does not have even what he has will be taken away from him. For Jesus, the reward for listening and growing is receiving more. But for the one who does not have what he or she has will be taken away. There is no stagnation in this spiritual life. Either you are growing in your life spiritually or you are shrinking. Many of us here have taken a foreign language or if you're in college, whatever, you may be taking it now or high school, you may be in the midst of it. Well, I took a foreign language. I took Spanish. My sophomore and junior year, high, uh, junior year high of high school, 1990 and 1991, like Fred Sanford said, a lot of years, a lot of years. But I remember taking this class and while I would go to the class, um, 
man, I'm, I'm learning words that I, that, that I had never heard before. And I would go home and I would share that information with my mom. Like, mom, look at what I learned. And man, this and that. And, and, but I was literally only in the, in the class to fulfill a requirement. Once I finished those two years, no more Spanish, no more Espanol. Ask me today how much Spanish I know. I think I know two words and one phrase. See, si, no, and como estas. Doesn't that mean uh, how you doing? I, that's, that's all I know. Why is it like that? It's because I had no intention of continuing to develop this language. What I learned in the early 90s has become largely forgotten because I didn't want to develop it. When it comes to the things of God, the reason I want to continue and learn to learn and grow is because of the work of the spirit in my life. I realize that as I continue to pursue him, as I continue to want to know him, that that he will continue to help me to grow, that he will continue to give me insight. But the only reason I want to pursue him is because of the work that he's doing in me. Right. This 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 work that's taking place in my soul. But if I get to the place where I feel like, you know what, I've learned enough. I'm good. That I don't want to study God's word anymore, that I don't need to know enough like I already know that. Now I'm about to out myself and maybe some of you as well. But have you ever gone to church on a Sunday and you heard the pastor preaching? You said, I don't want to hear that. I know that already. I know that already. See, if we, if, if we have that posture that I don't need to learn that anymore, we will continue to, we will find ourselves continuing to shrink, right? The things that we have been entrusted with, God says, oh, so you don't want to use what I've given you? Let me get that out to you. Do you want to know more of him, my friends? If you do, how are you pursuing him? How are you pursuing him? Is the reading and studying of scripture a priority for you? Is it a priority? Now, I know that because I've used it. I know that I I was too busy to read today. We, We cannot use busyness as an excuse to not pursue the father. We cannot use busyness as an excuse because he will not take a back seat to anything or to anyone. Like the stewards in Matthew 25, if we are in Christ, God has entrusted to us things as followers of Christ that his resources that we must put to work, right? If we are not faithful with what he has given us, even what he has given us will be taken away. That's for his followers. But for those who are not in Christ, he, God is not entrusting his resources to a non-believer or one who is far from God. But a person who is far from God does not have to stay far from God. All a person has to do is this. Recognize Jesus as the personal savior. That he died on the cross for you in your place for your sins to give you eternal life as your sin bearer. If you trust in him, you will be saved. Not only that, but once you are saved, you are not saved to isolation. You are saved to be a part of a body of believers who will continue to help you grow in your faith. Not only that, But then we would truly be given a purpose for living. So if you don't know him today, will you trust him? Let's pray. Lord, my prayer for us is that truly that you would give us ears to hear. Ears to hear and hearts to obey. Uh, We don't want this to our gathering even in the midst of COVID, even in the midst of all this this turmoil that we see, to just be a rote exercise. But Lord, your mission continues. And as followers of Christ, we are a part of that mission. So Lord God, we ask that you, by your spirit, give us the energy to obey and to honor you. In Christ's name, amen.